I'm Philip Daniels. I'm Joe Cardoza. I'm Larry Bissang. And this is The Perspective. And this is The Perspective. Welcome to The Perspective. And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to The Perspective. Alongside Philip Daniels, Joe Cardozo, I am Larry Bassani, coming to you from a wet and rainy Los Angeles, California. Uh, so much to cover, gentlemen. Uh, boy, we've got a lot to delve into. Uh, let's just start with the obvious, uh, the the uh, insanity that is the Indianapolis Colts over the last week. And uh, gentlemen, I'm going to turn it right over. Philip, I mean, you, you know some of the players in this game. Uh, I know that you and Frank Reich were on the same staff, and this has just been a very interesting uh, turn of events over the last couple of days. Uh, where do we begin? I don't know, man. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, me and Frank was on the Eagles one Super Bowl together. Great guy. Um, he just uh, one of those guys that work hard. I mean, he worked late nights. He put all the effort into it to trying to win games. And, you know, I remember being with the Eagles and two in the morning, I'm leaving. He's still there grinding. Uh, I used to leave snacks on his desk just so you have something to snack on while he was in there working. So, but he's one of those guys where, you know, Everybody love him, you know, especially in Philly. He, he brought a Super Bowl to that, to the team, and uh, and also, you know, he was the offensive coordinator there. He did a lot of good things with the quarterback, with Carson Wentz and those guys. So and Foles. So yeah, it's, it's tough, man. It's always tough when you get fired. I've been through it. I got fired, even though I, I thought I did a great job, you know. Um, then you look at that situation where uh, he goes into the season and uh, he has an older quarterback and replaces him with a younger quarterback. And they play they play Bill Belichick of all people, and that 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 wasn't going to go well. I, I knew that from the get go. You know when he played at home the week before, and now he got to go on the road and play Bill Bill play Bill Belichick defense, and it just wasn't going to go well. But it was kind of I, I never I didn't see it coming because of the fact that you know they did go to the young quarterback, and the fact that Frank has done a decent job over the years, he just never had a quarterback that was stable enough to get it done for him. Philip, I, I tell you what, I am going to go back to I'm going to advance a little bit and go to the mailbag a little prematurely because we got a, We got a, uh, a question that was specifically addressing this issue. And this is so important that I uh, I want to I'll move this up. So Harold asked you, he said, Mr. Daniels, you work with Frank Reich. Will he get another chance? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, when you get fired, man, and Frank's done a great job. You know, he was off, like I said, he was the offense coordinator for a Super Bowl winning team. Uh, if not a head coach, he would get another opportunity as an offensive coordinator. Uh, I wouldn't put out the picture that he couldn't be a head coach again somewhere. Um, Frank, he really do a good job. You know, he, he, he I mean, you look at the coach, man. He was those, when he first got there, they were actually winning games. You know, what I'm saying they didn't have everything in place, but they were actually winning games. So I think he'll get another chance down the road somewhere. Somebody that need maybe, if not a head coach, but somebody that need an offensive coordinator that that works as hard as he do, getting getting guys prepared to win games. Yo, where do we start? I mean, just uh, the like you said, Larry, the events we've seen in the last 48 hours, if it's even been that, it's been incredible. I mean, I, I knew that with the start that the Indianapolis Colts had, definitely possible that Frank Wright would be let go. I'm not so surprised by that. It's the NFL, and we know how things work in that league. What I'm shocked and surprised about is just what's happened since then. I, I, I mean, <laughs> to make it kind of personal, you had me – who was watching get up on a Monday morning with Jeff Saturday on there, who does a great job. He's one of the best NFL commentators that ESPN had. He's doing that show with Dominic Foxworthy doing his thing. And then a few hours later, literally out of left field, right field, center field, uh, he's named the head coach of the Indianapolis Colts with zero uh, NFL head coach uh, coaching experience at all in the NFL. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, only experience he has coaching is at the high school level, which I'm not even sure if he's currently doing right now. That is correct. I just think about the other coaches on the Colts staff, the other coaches around the NFL. I'm not just talking about black coaches, just coaches, period. You're a guy that's been an OC for seven years waiting for a shot or a defensive coordinator waiting for a shot. And it's almost like they went into a crowd and said, hey, you. And Jeff Saturday was like, me? Yeah, you're the coach. Come on, buddy. Come on. Get in the game. It's just it's wild to me. It's wild. You know, those are a lot of my points that that I was going to go to is, number one, first of all, I think we should be very sensitive to uh, 
we're all very aware of the uh, the hiring procedures and, and process. And I mean, I, I've long advocated that this is why we have the Rooney Rule to begin with. Okay, for people to be able to have the opportunity, people who who put their grind in, people who get after it, who have been in this game for as long as some of these guys have. Uh, we saw that we saw this happen with the Colts a couple of years ago when Chuck Pagano. God forbid. I mean, my heart goes out to him. But when he was diagnosed with leukemia, you know, you have a guy in Bruce Arians who steps in as the interim coach. He shows what he can do in the next year. He's he's on the sidelines in Arizona. One of the things that really gets me about this entire ordeal that is the Indianapolis Colts is that and I say this with all respect to Jeff Saturday. He's phenomenal on ESPN. I think he does a great job. Uh, he's got this is no risk and potentially high reward because if he, if it doesn't work out for whatever reason, and it's safe to say, I mean, that, that, that roster is just, they're, they're, they're not built to, they're not built to even go 500. But if it doesn't work out for him for whatever reason, he goes right back to ESPN tomorrow. No yep. harm foul. You know, what about these other guys that, again, as you said, that have been in the building for the last couple of years i'm trying to think of when frank Reich got that job i believe it was three years ago four years ago yes yeah, right. um you know when he got that job all the people that are in that building what does that do i you know i'm both of you gentlemen have so much more of an expertise in football but i can tell you i i was an organizational behavior major i know what kind of happens when you have that turmoil and this guy from the outside who has done nothing to deserve this opportunity is getting this opportunity. What message does that send to that locker room? What message does that send to that entire coaching staff? Who's going to want to stick around for this? I mean, it's just going to be every man for himself. I expect, I, unfortunately, I expect mutiny. And I don't see how this is going to end well. Uh, gentlemen, I am more than, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I look at our, our co-host on the show. Uh, Phil, do you happen, to, you happen to have your Super Bowl ring around? I do, man. I do have it upstairs, but okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm just gonna lay this out there for you, Jim Ursay. This man right here, right down here, has more qualifications than your current head coach. I want you to think about that and the Facts. decision that you've made in order to move forward with your organization. Well, let, let, let me say this, Larry. Let me say this. You know, um, you know how how you say tank without actually saying you're gonna tank. Sure. Uh, that's kind of what this, this. That's what it feel like. That's what it sound like. Uh, to bring in Jeff Saturday, who's never coached uh, on that level. I know he played a whole lot of years. I mean, just as qualified as me for his playing years. But at the same time, he's never coached on a high level. And you know, to bring him off the street and not move someone up uh, in, on that level to um, take over that job and to see what they can do. Uh, it, to me, I just, I just feel like they're tanking and this is the way that they can solve their quarterback issue that they've had for what the last five years since Frank been there, actually. Um, so I think this is how they're going to go about doing it. And it's hard for me to believe that Jeff, uh, no matter how good he was as a football player, just going to step in and get on that sideline and be able to be involved in the play calling and all that stuff. And just and just be he's probably just gonna be a listener over there, listen to the calls. Probably can say run, give me a run here, give me a pass here, those kind of things. Because it's hard for me to believe that he's gonna be involved with the play calling and all the duties that go with a head coaching job. I just don't, I just don't see it. Um, but like this, this to me, like like this to me don't sound like a Chris Ballard kind of hire to me. I wanted to ask you about that, so I'm glad you went there. It's yeah, it, it, it don't sound like a Chris Ballard kind of thing that he would. It don't sound like something he would do. To me, Chris Ballard has been around football for a long, long time. Right. It just seemed like to me that Chris would have gave the opportunity to one of those guys that's in that building that know these guys that's you know that's making calls and and go from there. Maybe the, the you no, know, they, they fired the offense coordinator a week ago, so the quarterback coach is the only one that's left. Uh, why not move him up there? Why not move the defense coordinator up to that spot? You know, he's a veteran guy. So, I mean, I just don't – it just don't sound like a Chris Ballard kind of hire. Uh, and it seems like maybe there's other – maybe there's more to it than what we know and the reason Jeff's there. Now, for me, as a former guy and knowing that you always want opportunity, I, I'm pulling for Jeff. I hope Jeff going in and do a hell of a job. And uh, he played a long time, and I, I just hope he can just rally that those guys together and not lose the locker room because a lot of times you 
you don't you bring somebody from the outside that they don't actually know. It, sometimes it's hard to get up for a guy like that because you ain't Absolutely. sweat with them in the summer camps. Uh, and you ain't go out there and bleed with them through all that the, the first part of the year and all that stuff. And you just coming straight from the, the TV set. You coming straight from the, the desk to go over there and, and be a head coach. And it's just like, I know they're going to respect him because he played a long time. But the fact that he didn't battle with them the whole year, I'm just going to take a wait and see approach on how they approach him. Now, you never know. He may spark them. They may come out and play hard. But it's hard for me to believe that somebody from the outside is going to come in and get the attention of those players and they're going to go out there and just dominate. My question for you, Philip, also is twofold. Number one, is a move like this enough for Chris Ballard to walk away? And number two, is a move like this enough for people? This has already become sort of a uh, – th- th- this job is already a lightning rod to begin with. Um, you know, Jim Ursay has a reputation as kind of being a wild card, being a loose cannon. Um what does that say about this organization in terms of whoever the next permanent head coach is ultimately going to be? You know, one thing I know about Chris Ballard, he's one of the best um, minds when it comes to drafting guys and, and uh, personnel and all that stuff. He's one of the best out there. Uh, so what, I don't know if he'll walk away uh, or they force him to walk away. I, I'm not sure. But at the same time, he's one of the best in the business. So whatever happens, he's going to be fine. You know, he'll be on the next teams. When, you know, we've got two teams available now. He'll be on the next one smoking um, if that came to fruition. So I just think that, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tough situation. And it, I don't know. And I've, if Chris made that decision to go with Jeff, then that's on him. That's his decision. And maybe there's a tank thing that everybody's involved and everybody knows what's going on. They're trying to get the quarterback that they need. Uh, with all these quarterbacks coming out this year, it, you know, I would say that could be a good decision. Uh, if you're going to tank, just say you're going to tank without saying it. You know what I'm saying? Just go ahead and tell everybody, you know, this season is a, a wash and just go from there. Now, you're trying to keep the players together. You're trying to keep the locker room good. You're trying to get guys to stay competitive. But at the same time, I don't really think you're trying to win games when you're trying to get that number one pick to get the guy that you need in that building. And right now they're battling with Houston and some other teams, a couple of teams to try to get that done you know what I'm saying but you know Chris Ballard one of those guys he's aggressive in the draft he will move up and get who he want which is good I, I love the way he draft you know what I'm saying I remember mean, we, we had a guy that I like when I was in Philly and um guys were telling me that he wouldn't get drafted in the fourth round his name was Grover Stewart he wouldn't get drafted in the fourth round that he wouldn't you know he, he wouldn't even get drafted <laughs> and I was the one that said no he's gonna get drafted in the fourth round you don't find big guys like that well Chris Ballard drafted him in last pick in the fourth round Wow. And so he's one of those guys that I know for a fact that he has a good head on his shoulders, that he can make those picks, and he he ain't scared, he ain't afraid to make those picks. And he got a lot of talent on that team, young talent um, that he's working with. And so whoever get that job or whoever stick there, they're going to have a great opportunity. He does his homework for sure. Joe, I'll give you a uh, la- last point on this one. No, I just have to wonder, like Philip mentioned, what's going on in the locker room? I mean, how do the players feel? I mean, a guy, like I said, you literally saw this man on television last week, and now this is your leader of the men. How do you feel if you're a Reggie Wayne, a wide receiver coach, who's just kind of early on in his journey of coaching? Uh, How do you react to a guy coming off the streets, and now he's the head coach? Just the dynamic of the players and how they relate to Jeff Saturday and the coaches and how they relate to Jeff Saturday. I mean, today is Tuesday. I know you can't have that all figured out by the time of kickoff, but I just would be interested to know what those conversations, if they're even happening, are like right now. I mean, Philip could probably attest to this more than I can. I've never played professional sports before, but I'm just thinking if I was a member of the Colts and the TV guy is not my boss, uh, I don't know how I don't know how I feel as a player, and I, I don't know how I feel as an assistant coach. I didn't even get talked to for the job. They just found somebody on the sidelines and brought him in. Well, I feel like the quarterback coach, since they fired the offensive coordinator already, I feel like the quarterback coach, the defensive coordinator, or uh, those guys would be like, "Why not move me up?" You know what I'm saying? Why not get? Why didn't I get the opportunity? Because you bring a guy off the street who's who just he played there, but he's never coached before. Yeah, it would, it would kind of be some whispering going on in the building. It would be some little side bars going on, and I'm pretty sure it is. But at the same time, I'm, I'm hoping that Jeff, when he came in there, he came in there, he, he sat him down, he talked to him, and he said, listen, I was thrust into this role. I don't want to demean any of you. It wasn't my call, you know what I'm saying? It was their call. But I want us to be able to work together to finish this season for the, be- for the betterment of the guys in the building. So 
I think Jeff will do that. I think Jeff is going to come in there and say, hey, listen, I don't claim to know everything. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to need all you guys' help. I'm going to need as much help as I can get to finish this season, get through it. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I apologize to the guys that didn't get the opportunity that should have moved, that been here the whole time, that you know maybe should have moved up, but they called me, you know, and they asked me to come in here, and I'm just doing what they asked me to do. Phil, I'm gonna ask, I, I'll I'll take the last question on this. I'm gonna ask you just candidly uh, if you're on that coaching staff or if you're in that locker room, how does this hit for you? It hit hard as if you're a coach that you you looking for an opportunity to be a head coach one day, and you like. I'm saying you're coordinator and you're a quarterback coach on that team and you're looking for the opportunity and you thought you had it right there and they let Frank go and they were going to move somebody up in the building and that don't happen. And you bring in an outside guy, which kind of, you know, in a way, you know, it's according to how they look at it. They can look at it as if they don't have enough trust in me to do it. You know, they don't believe in me as a coach. Uh, you bought somebody else in over me and I got all this experience. Your defense coordinator was a head coach in Jacksonville. Think about that. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we sitting there, um, you know, bringing in other guys, guys off the street that ain't even coach that was sit, that's in a studio talking football. And <laughs> yeah, we've been here all year planning football. We've been planning games and spending these late night hours in here just, just scrambling, trying to get wins. And now we got an outside guy that wasn't even here none of that time, fresh off the streets. And now we got to go and figure all this stuff out again. But, we, I mean, they got to keep coaching, you know, so they get paid to coach. That's one thing they get. That's one thing that's got to happen. But at the same time, yeah, it will bother me a little bit as a coach. To, I'm, that's never happened before. You know what I'm saying? I've never seen a team. I've never seen a team bring somebody off the street to coach and not move someone up in that in position. the middle of the season. That's new to all of us. This has got to be the wildest hire. Everybody. This has I, to be the wildest hire I've ever seen in the NFL. I want to see. I just want to see how it go. You know what I'm saying? I want to see yeah. how it end. Um, and then go from there. And maybe Jeff will come in there and do a good job. Maybe they'll hire him next year, you know. Maybe be, maybe be a head coach. The but. only thing I can compare this to is when Buck Showalter was brought in to manage the Orioles a few years ago, but he already had managerial experience with the Rangers and with the New York Yankees. So, I mean, Saturday has never blown the whistle one time. I, yeah, that's, I, the, that's the thing right there, Larry. That's the thing. He's never done it on the NFL level. He, he's been coached on the NFL level, but right. there's a difference in being coached and going in there and actually coaching. Um, I'll see if he was like the, the offensive line coach. He got moved up to that spot. Sure. But, you know, for, first thing I asked when he got hired was, I said, was he in the building? And then they said, no, he wasn't in the building. I was like, what? I've never seen that before. So my thing is he got to win a lot of people over. I mean, yeah. he coming in there and he, he can't come in there like all hard and stuff and, and getting on the guys and that kind of stuff. And you got to like even good. kill. You got to even kill because yeah. these guys done went through the pain all year. They done went through the losses and the, and the tough wins and, and the battles and in, in, in training camp and all that stuff. Uh, you no, know, because some of them went through COVID and all that stuff. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. my thing is, he got to come in there and, and garner their respect some kind of way. Um, but still, if I'm a coach on that staff and I felt like I've done a great job all year, my unit's playing well, I, I deserve an opportunity. Yeah, it's a little dissension there. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it, we I'm could go on and on and on about this, but uh, gentlemen, I'm, I'm going to change gears a little bit and go from uh, one train wreck to another. Um, <laughs> well, uh, wow. this is this is an organization that's near and dear to all three of us, uh, whether as fans or as former players. Um, it looks like uh, Mr. Snyder is finally on his way out the door. I don't know where to begin as far as this is concerned, how we have gotten here. Uh, I, I, Whoever wants to take the floor, it's yours. Well, I'm excited. This is like Christmas. When I, when I saw that news. Oh, happy when the, day. When I saw the news uh, that he was possibly selling the team, I, I, where I was at that moment, I stepped outside and just did a little quick dance and went back inside. And I've been doing it ever since. I don't want to read rumors about potentially Jeff Bezos, potentially Jay-Z. I just want to hear the read the headline that says it's done and the team has been sold and he's done. Because I have a feeling whoever buys this team, I'm calling it now, within three to five years, they'll be back to close to what they used to be as far as like competitive. You might even have a new stadium. People will actually want to come watch the game and play there. It's going to be a, con a complete organizational shift pretty quickly. Yes. Um yeah, we covered this last the last show we was on yeah. a little bit. Yeah. And to me, uh, you know, like I said, um, 
you know, I, I think it might be the best decision for Dan. You know, I mean, with all the stuff that's happening, everything that's going on there, um, whether it's and we've heard rumors for like a while now that Bezos wanted to buy a team. And so if it's Bezos, if it's Jay-Z and all of them together, it's fine. You know what I'm saying? But uh, I just think that, you know, whoever by the team can come in there, you know, get that stadium fixed for one thing, get that stadium yeah. right, or, or build a new stadium and uh, start to, you know, get the commanders back on the right track. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, they got so much talent there. Um, I mean, look at the first rounders that they got. Now, I, I, I told you guys this on the last show that um, I don't think they got a lot of depth behind that talent now because they let a lot of those guys go. But at the same time, whoever buy this team, they're inheriting a great situation, a great fan base. Right. Uh, I mean, the fans are passionate there, man. They yep. love they love they, they, they love the guy. They, someone won't even let go of the the other term that they call the team. Yeah, so, no, nah, they won't. They won't let go. They want to come back. Somebody, I saw somebody uh, on Facebook write that today and said that if Bezos get the team, maybe uh, you know, get the the nickname back. Get the. I said that ain't happening. Yeah, nah, that ain't no, happening. That's a, that's a league. That's a league thing that that um, they made happen because they felt like it was a uh, it was just uh, it was a slur. So I mean, they don't they didn't want they don't want that to happen. That's not going to happen. But the thing is. They can get this team, get them back on track, get them where they need to go. Dan can ride off into the sunset with a bunch of money in his pocket and then let the, uh, all the headaches and all the things that he's dealt with there um, be gone, you know what I'm saying? Because, um, I mean, whether it's bought on him, it, whether it's bought by him or on, on himself or somebody else just, you know, I can tell you, like, like I told you all last time we talked, it's like, you know, men lie, women lie. Who knows the truth in a lot of this stuff? But at the same time, at least it gives him a chance to get out of a situation and move on with his life, him and his wife and, and his family, and that uh, somebody can come and get this team and, and get these guys going in the right direction. Well, you know, Phil, you, you hit on something there. I mean, I think that as long as the, uh, the arrows were being fired at Dan Snyder, I don't think it really became too personal with him until, uh, I guess, a couple of weeks ago, a week ago. They were booing Tanya Snyder and, you know, she's there for the breast cancer uh, awareness. And she's certainly done an incredible job bringing uh, breast cancer awareness to the forefront of the NFL. And she's absolutely to be applauded for that. But when I think when people start booing your wife and your children and <laughs> at some point you just start to wonder, you know, is, it, is this even worth it? I can cash out. I will have I will be able to give each of my three children billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. They'll have more money than they know what to do with. Um, to your she, point, she's a, listen, she's a wonderful woman. I mean, I've never heard me. anything bad about her. Never, yeah, never, man. Never. She started breast cancer awareness. You know, she uh, a breast cancer survivor. And right. for the fans to boo her, uh, I think that's very, very disrespectful with all she's done for that yes. for that organization and, and bringing that bringing breast cancer awareness to the forefront. I just think that's disrespectful. You know what I'm saying? I mean, Dan, yes, he probably heard the booze when he started booing her. Yeah. It was time um, to decide whether what he got to do, got to sell this team. Right. Um, to, to your point, Philip, I do want to say also now, uh, if they were to go back to that name, the only way that they, I think you could justify that would be if I don't know how much money the Piscataway tribe has, but I know mm -hmm. that the Mohegans. You have to they, buy it. The, yeah. the Mohegans are own, own every other casino outside of Atlantic City and Vegas. They've got more than enough money in the coffers to buy the team. And I think if that if something like that happened where the Mohegans or the Ojibwas or again, I don't know how much money like the Piscataways locally in the DC area have. Not but, happening. But they they, they they won't they they wouldn't bring the name back though. Yeah, too much research and money. You know what I'm saying? Your if they, if they got enough, it's enough for them to say that it's a it's a racial slur. It's a slur. It's right. enough for them to say that. So they wouldn't be able to bring the name back even if they bought the team. You see what I'm saying? Oh, for sure, for sure. Uh, it's the only the only um, scenario where I could see something like that happening. But I will put something out to you here. Um, I have long been a critic of Roger Goodell, but I will say that he is definitely very interested in having a black owner with a prominent franchise in place. Uh, and, I, and that is absolutely to be applauded. Um, I, I don't think there's a lot of value in the commander's name. It's not the name that a lot of people have affiliated with the franchise for, for 80 years. 
um, you know, that you you lost a lot of that brand equity a couple of years ago when the former name was retired. But I could see if you have a black owner, a uh, whether it's Jay Z, I now Kevin Durant is apparently. Mm -hmm. uh, in the mix for a piece of the action. And I would not underestimate that this, this is a man who has quietly made more money in Silicon Valley than he did on the basketball court. So, uh, David Stewart could get into this. Robert Smith could get into this. So you could very well have an African-American owner. I'm going to throw something at you guys. You could go back to red tails to honor the Tuskegee airmen. Hail to the red tails, hail victory, brave on the war path, fight for old DC. And in, you could turn something that was a racial slur into something where you're honoring a very distinguished group of people who were oppressed in this country and did incredible things for America when we were at war and there was no question as to who the enemy was. Um, this is very personal to me as well. My father was a meteorologist and he forecasted for the Tuskegee Airmen. And, uh, you know, this would mean a lot to me on a personal level. So there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I think that there's also a huge ego stroke that could potentially be in play if you are the guy to come in or or woman to come in sort of, you know, on from the ivory tower kind of thing. And you, you get the uh, you get a new stadium in place. You get that team back rolling. You get that fan base back. Um, you're potentially if you get a new stadium, you're talking about a Super Bowl. We know that. And, you know, I mean, it, it, we're not talking about. A market that's insignificant. I mean, if New York could get a Super Bowl, Washington, D.C. could absolutely get a Super Bowl. The RFK location is back in place. Uh, I think that Maryland would step back into the game. You could see them at the National Harbor, uh, you know, maybe out in Virginia. But I mean, I think if you get the right person in place, uh, the right team of investors, owners in place, that this could this could absolutely uh, come to fruition. All of that and then some. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Larry, I, I do think they already got some land set aside in Virginia for the stadium. I remember when I first got there, uh, I was going to get my physical, and I remember the head trainer telling me that you see this, you see this land over here, and I said, "Yeah, what about it?" And he said, "This is where they want to build a new stadium if they get it in Virginia." So I, I can kind of see Virginia wow. getting a new stadium and maybe getting it closer to their facility, and uh, I can see them doing that. And um, you know, my thing is, I just feel like. You know, yeah, you, you're talking about black owner, you know, with Jay Z. If you want to, if Jay Z come in, and you know, I would like to see, one, I would like to see all the football players in the league chip in and, and get to get the team, have a player. Hmm, that'd team, be awesome. You know, you know yeah. what I'm saying? That would be so awesome. Five percent of the league, right there. Yeah, that would be so awesome. You know what I'm saying? They're all of them just chip in and just buy the buy the team for them, and have a team. You know, have somebody run it for them. But that that probably I won't ever happen. But at the same time. <laughs> Uh, I just feel like uh, whoever get that thing now, this fan base that they're going to inherit, they're a loyal fan base. I yes. mean, one thing about Washington, they show up no matter if they win or lose, they're going to come and support the team. Now, there was only one time that they really didn't show up. And actually, I, was, I think it was the year before COVID because they was talking about when COVID came. They said that they were already they were already doing COVID restrictions before <laughs> COVID even hit because they were so, <laughs> so less. Well, nobody in the stands, you know what I'm saying? I remember playing there. I remember playing there one year, and this is the first time I ever saw this. Um, we were coming in, and that's when I coached at Philly. We was coming in there, and the first time I ever seen fans clap for a visiting bus instead of throwing eggs or, or, or shooting birds at it. And I'm like, man, they, these, these fans, they tired. They tired yeah, of losing. Sure. They're, they're tired of everything. And so my thing is, they loyal, though. They were there, and we were in that stadium, man, and it felt like a home game for us. It was so many of our fans in that stadium, man. It, it was crazy. It was, it was like a home game. So, but like I said, they, the fan base is loyal. If you can just put a product on the field that that going to compete, yeah. and, and if they're going to compete, and they're going they're going to be there. And the sad thing is that a lot of that fan base, that natural fan base that you would grow organically there in the DMV, uh, you know, all three of us got a, got a few gray hairs in the beard and in our, and in our our temples. We remember what that franchise was like when it was on top of the world. The, they, this has been 25 years of just not winning football. And uh, we also remember what it was like. Bill, did you ever play in RFK? I didn't. I didn't. Oh, okay. Not on TV, though. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm sure you remember, you know, the the, the – Yeah, the, they said the stands were moved. Yeah. Absolutely. I yeah. mean, you know, that was a 55,000-seat madhouse. And I'll tell you, 
I would put that experience, um, that home field advantage against anything in the league, the, you know, whether it's Kansas City or whether it's Seattle or, or I mean, nobody could could compete with the amount of noise that 55,000 people could make there. Uh, one last point I want to make is they're talking about, I, I guess, Jay Glazer put out their seven billion dollars uh, this past Sunday. Um, I remember when Snyder bought the team from Mr. Cook's estate and they were thinking four to five hundred million dollars optimistically. Team ended up going for eight hundred million. I think seven billion is just going to get you a seat at the table. My my offhand guess is eight to ten billion dollars. Do you gentlemen have any any thoughts on that's that? not my not my forte. Uh, I, I don't, I'm man, just, but you know what? <laughs> I'm just I don't, he's leaving. Like I said. The, the fight that I played there, and I know how these fans are, and I know how passionate they are. It would be well worth it, you know what I'm saying? If if you got 10 sure. billion for it, whatever, you know what I'm saying? Cause it's the second, you know, largest franchise behind Dallas. It was at least. Right. Uh, and my thing is, you know, if you can get that product on the field better and get the guys that you need and the coaches in there that you need, whatever, you won't you're gonna have a great opportunity to make uh all that back in there some. And right. And uh my thing is it's worth it, man. I I just think that. I don't know if they will get that for with them changing the name and all the stuff that then this organization has been through and all the negativity. He may not get that. Maybe probably more on the seven, eight, eight billion side. But uh, it's worth it though. You know what I mean, I think whoever come in there and get that, and they you got two or three guys, maybe four guys going in together to do that. Um, they will they will be happy with the product. And I also think too. My last point, Larry, before you move on. I think that if you start to get a better product on the field, people are going to start buying that merchandise. Like I, I got the name is done. Like there's a lot of people still in the area. I mean, I still live in the DMV who are hanging on by a thread that any they literally think any day now the old name will come back. It's not going to happen. I don't think it's going to be Red Tail. There's commanders to stay. And I think if you get a winning product on the field, the hoodies, the hats, the jackets, people will buy that. No one's going to buy and represent a team that sucks on the field. And oh yeah, by the way, has a ton of issues off the field as well. You, you don't want to be wearing that product, right? See, I, see, I wanted I wanted the Washington Razorbacks. That's what I wanted. I wanted the red. I wanted because the. Uh, they know as hogs, you know. I wanted right, the red right. wolves. I wanted to be howling on third down. <laughs> we get a bunch of false starts, but come I, I mean, I'm I'm with the Commanders. I'm I'm of the I'm of the vein that the name's not going to go back. You're getting used to it now. See? Yeah. I was, definitely, I was definitely high on red tails. I felt you could go beat, beat them, bomb them, touchdown, let the points soar. One or two, na- one or two word changes in the in the fight song, and uh, red tails is so close to the former name that mm-hmm. it it lent itself to uh, to just being able to be brandable and marketable and close enough to where you're not losing so much of that identity that you had established for seventy eight. Excuse me, 78 years. Uh, Jim, let me ask you this, though, Larry. Sure. Let me ask you this. Do they still play that? They play the song still at yep. stadium still, right? Yep. That's my words. And they still say Redskins. No, change it around. But they um, – They change it around? Yeah, change a couple but, of lyrics. Well, okay. But so they, if, you uh, t- if you go Red Tails, I'm pretty sure that somebody's going to forget. <laughs> and they're going to say the word. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Just so, clouds. I'm just, I'm just saying. I, I, we'll see right now. I look. I can see them doing that. So it, it would be. Um, I, I mean, I, I love the name again. You know, the the, the DMV has the most prominent um, African American middle class in America. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I and there are so many people that I'm sure Joe and I both know where a grandfather and a grand uncle somebody was affiliated with the Tuskegee Airmen. I mean, I know, for example, I know somebody lives down in Indian Head. I'm sure you probably know who, who I'm, I'm referring to, Joe, that, you know, I mean, I believe he had a, a grand uncle who was, um, he, he might have been a, I don't know if he was a pilot, but he was, I think he was a mechanic on those planes. So uh, there's a lot of connections there in the, in the D.C. area to the, peop- the, the, the Tuskegee Airmen who were, of course, again, Phenomenal Americans who were oppressed, who right. overcame some just horrific situations in order to become iconic heroes for us all to look up to. So mm-hmm. much to cover, so much to get into. We haven't even started talking yet about uh, the way that people are, uh, the way these teams are playing right now and what to look forward next to. A uh, lot to talk about with the Packers, a lot to talk about with the Rams. Uh, can Buffalo find a, uh, can, can Buffalo find a running game? Stick around. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna take a quick break, pay a few bills. We'll come back on the other side. You're listening to the perspective right here on Nuts and Bolts Sports.
This commercial is brought to you by True Brain. Say hello to True Brain. We're not magicians. We're not going to turn you into a rocket scientist, unless you're already a rocket scientist. We're not big pharma, and our products are custom made to boost mental output. We empower people to do their best thinking. And welcome back, everybody. You're watching the perspective here on Nuts and Bolts Sports. Uh, boy, I got to tell you, gentlemen, this has been uh, an interesting uh, turn of events this season. I don't think any of us saw some of this coming. Um, the Rams, Phil, if you're on that staff, what, what, where do we begin? It's tough, man. Um, <laughs> we, talk, we talked to them before and we was saying the motivation part of it. it's got to be there. Especially if you go to the Super Bowl and you win it. Uh, it's hard to get guys motivated to come back and do it again. Uh, you know, sometimes you go out there and you're smelling yourself a little bit too much and, and you're not doing the job that you did before. You know, we made playoffs a bunch of years in a row, but at the same time, it was a it was a hard job trying to get guys to focus and stay hungry. And that's what they're going through right now. They're just going through some growing pains. I really do feel like Stafford's hurt. I feel like he don't he just don't have that same velocity on his ball as he did before. And in that position right there in itself can win a lot of games for you. So when you you have a quarterback that's going through what he's going through, it's tough, man. And then it seems like to me the defense ain't playing up to par as they did the Super Bowl year last year. But at the same time, you know, so I think they just got to figure it out, come back together, regroup. But, um, you know, like I said, this year is probably, I hate to say it, but it's probably done. Um, they they way behind the eight ball right now, it's like, like – um, it's just tough, man. I mean, I have nothing, nothing, nothing else to say about it, but just sad seeing um, the things happen to that team that's happening right now when we all know what kind of team that really is, you know what I'm saying? And like I say, they let some people go, like Von Miller and those people. You know, you probably let too many people go. You traded your receivers. Uh, it's a lot of things that happened during the offseason. So, but things you got to do. I mean, salary caps play a part of this. Uh, this league has become more like, even now, like, you know, any team can go and win that thing now. Yep. Um, you look at some of these teams right now, who, who knows? Seattle can go win it. The Jets can go win it. You know, they, they built for it. Both of them can go do it. You know what I'm saying? So it's it's one of those things where you're seeing some of these young teams that, that wasn't winning a lot before starting to step up to the forefront. Yeah, for sure. I definitely agree with Philip. I have to question the want to as far as the repeat goes. And I also feel like it's a lot of injuries, too. I mean, Matthew Stafford's not really healthy. Mm -hmm. Your wide receiving corp has kind of been decimated by injuries. Who's your running back? I mean, one week you're reading about Cam Akers not being a member of the Los Angeles Rams. Next thing you know, he's catching a screen pass on the third down. So I just feel like obviously the main goal was to win a championship. You did that. We had They had fun with their T-shirts after those picks. You probably could have used some of those picks to add depth to your team. But as we've seen, like Phillip said, a lot of parity in the NFL. And as we have seen, when you win a Super Bowl, what are teams going to want to do in this copycat league? They want to cherry pick those people. That backup cornerback you had that was a key to your championship, that linebacker that stepped in for a few games when somebody was injured. When those people become free agents, they start throwing those dollar signs out. That's how you lose your depth. Like I just think about some of the names going way back. But think about a guy like a Larry Brown that won the Super Bowl MVP for the Cowboys. Big money with the with the Raiders. Didn't really pan out. Think about the guy that played safety, Dexter something, for the Buccaneers. Mm -hmm. MVP of the Super Bowl. Big money contract. Didn't really pan out. But that chipped away at that depth for those teams. I think the Rams just got to – I, in my opinion, if I'm a Rams front office guy, this season's a wash. What can we do to get back next year to where we need to be? Hey, and I would also – I would also consider – being honest with you, at a certain point, at some point, I would consider sitting Stafford and let him get have surgery or whatever he got to do um, to get himself ready for next year, the following year. So, I mean, that's got to happen. You know what I'm saying? They got to start talking about that soon. We just sit Stafford, go with the backup quarterback to finish the season out because it, it gets to, after a certain point, you know, it's the best thing to do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, one of the things that did not really come to the surface, I don't know how much it came to the surface out there where you guys are. But that quietly, the Rams were waiting for Garoppolo to get cut by the Niners because they were gonna they were gonna bring him in because I think they know, excuse me, I think they know there's more going on with Stafford's wing than what he's letting on. Um, that like you know, it was, I believe it was you who said it earlier, Joe, that you know, or maybe it was you, Phil, that, uh, that, that Stafford doesn't have the same zip on the ball this year. Uh, again, you've lost Beckham, you've lost Von Miller, 
this is not the same roster that you had uh, last year. And, you know, you, you took, you took a couple of my points here about Larry Brown, but uh, nevertheless, I mean, you know, the truth of the matter also is this, you can only lose so many coordinators. Uh, you know, yeah. every other year you're, you're losing a defensive coordinator in Brandon Staley or an offensive coordinator who goes somewhere else. And, uh, you know, it, it's at, at some point you can only stop the bleeding, but for so long. So, uh, you know, I, I, I still think the Rams could make a, a late wild card push, but uh, I think in terms of, of playing for the division, I it's over. Um, and interestingly enough, I'm going to switch gears, but keep it in the, keep it in the NFC West, uh, gentlemen. There's a team that came out of nowhere that I had picked to go three and fourteen, and uh, I'm going to end up having to buy somebody a steak dinner because I made a bet there was no way they were going to win seven games, and. Uh, yeah, I got to start looking at how much Ruth Chris or uh, one of these places costs because this one's coming out of my pocket. But uh, <laughs> Seattle Seahawks, uh, where do we begin? You know, I'm gonna. I again, I can advance it a little bit. We got a, a question from uh, I just saw it earlier from from Vincent who wants to know uh, is Geno Smith a legitimate MVP candidate nowadays? So, lot to unpack there. Uh, take a swing. Why not? You know. I mean, think about it. They let Russell Wilson go. I mean, they received a whole lot of draft picks for him. Yep. So like, like Larry was saying earlier when when uh, the Rams were saying F those picks, well, Seattle saying thank you for the picks. <laughs> we got Geno. And Geno's doing a great job, man. One of the most accurate quarterbacks. I think he's second. Most accurate quarterbacks in the league. And he's yeah, carrying he's the top team. One or two. And they're winning. And they're winning, you know what I'm saying? And it, <laughs> you don't even miss Russell Wilson. You look what Russell going through in Denver, and then look what he's going through. That's why sometimes I say the grass ain't always green on the other side. Amen. You know, in Seattle, you got two weapons in Metcalf and, and uh, start the receiver, uh, Lockett. No, yep. start the receiver. Lockett, yep. yeah. Lockett, yeah. Lockett, little kid. Yeah. So yeah, you got, <laughs> you got two dominant receivers there. You know what I'm saying? That you can just throw that thing up, they're probably gonna go get it. Um, and that's you know, Gino got that. You know, so I don't think you can compare the receivers in in Denver to what they had in Seattle. And so now Russell learned that the hard way. And plus, I think he's hurt this year, too. So I can't knock him too much. But uh, he's going through some injuries, too. And hopefully he can bounce back next year. Because this year is, is, is pretty much over with and done. Um, but Geno should be considered for MVP because nobody expected that team to be even, even the hunt. They didn't expect them to be in the hunt. They didn't expect nothing out of this team. We thought this team was going to get killed this year. You know what I'm saying? They <laughs> traded – Traded every traded guys away. They bought in the backup or the quarterback from Denver, which who we thought was going to be the starter. Yeah, Drew Lock. Drew Lock. And all of a sudden, Geno jumped in the picture, and we like just looking at Geno's pass, and he's been a journeyman. We was like, ain't no way. So, but to look at what he's doing and how he's carrying that team, he should be up there. He should be up there with the MVP race. He should be talked about. You just cannot knock the guy because he's a journeyman, and all of a sudden, you know, you just don't think he's worthy. Yeah, he is worthy. He he's winning, and that's all that matters. Yeah. Now he may not be putting up those kind of stats that an MVP would normally put up, but he's he's second in accuracy. He's second in in something. You know, he's doing good. So are they winning. He should be an MVP conversation. Yeah, I would tend to agree. I mean, obviously his numbers are not flashy, but at the end of the day, what's the most important thing is did we get the dub? Yes or no? And they're getting lots of dubs in Seattle. Shout out to Pete Carroll who wanted to go back to kind of what they did during their little run when they had Marshawn Lynch, which is run the ball, play when you have to pass the ball when you have to, and a good play style of defense. And so far that's working for the Seahawks. And because, like you said, Larry, everyone has such low expectations for them. I think a lot of these teams are taking them for granted. Even now with their winning record and the good football Seahawks are playing, I think some NFL teams are still thinking, oh, no, we got this. And they're finding out pretty quickly, oh, no, we don't got this. So I think that should Geno Smith's name be tossed around in the MVP conversation? Yes, it should. Will he win the award? No. I think when you got big names like Patrick Mahomes is otherworldly, uh, Josh Allen, depending on what happens at the elbow, I don't think at the time of the recording of the show, if they've announced any updates in his elbow, people like Lamar Jackson, he won't win the award, but I definitely think when they start talking about candidates, he's one of the candidates. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, I think that uh, what Pete Carroll has done uh, is he, he should absolutely be considered for coach of the year as well. Yes. Uh, he has always had an unwavering belief in Geno Smith. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody's ever questioned Geno's intelligence. I don't think anybody's ever questioned his arm strength. He's got the size. It was just always a matter of, you know, the this, this situation just wasn't right. I'm willing to give almost anybody a mulligan 
if they played for the Jets about five, 10 years ago. And you know, <laughs> he, was, he was drafted into that organization. And, uh, you know, it was, it, it, there's, that was a tough road to hoe. There's no question about it. Uh, you know, he, he backed up in uh, New York for a minute. And then, of course, he ended up out in, in Seattle. Um, you know, but uh, I think it, it's, it's really interesting to watch Pete Carroll. This is a 70-year-old man who's got just so much youthful enthusiasm. And you can see they're really starting to, to rebuild just that, that, that excitement, that enthusiasm that they had 10 years ago or so when Russell was a rookie. And you had the Legion of Boom. And you, of course, you, Marshawn Lynch. We talked, we hit on that. And you know, this could be something special that I don't think any of us saw coming. I mean, again, full disclosure, I had them at three and 14 this year. I just, you know, I, I thought they were competing for the first or second pick in the draft that Pete was probably going to quietly go off into the sunset, enjoy his millions in Southern California and call it a day. Um, they could win the division. Yeah, no, for sure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Mina Kimes, who, who said she thought this could be an eight to nine one team. And I thought the same thing as you, Larry. What is she talking about? Letting her fandom cloud her judgment. <laughs> Maybe she's something we didn't know. I, I'm telling you. So uh, you also mentioned uh, the aforementioned Josh Allen. I want to dive into this a little bit as well, gentlemen. The, uh, the Bills lost to the Jets this weekend. And uh, I, I can tell you firsthand, it looks like uh, Buffalo's going to have some problems if they can't establish the run. Because, again, you know you know this as well as anybody, Philip. you got to run in order to be able to throw the ball. It, 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 keeps the defend, it keeps the defense honest. It brings them into the box a little bit. You can't blow the top off of a defense if you uh, if you got to come in and play to run. Uh, what happens with Buffalo? What do they need? And if this is going to be an issue for them, what does this mean come January? You know, to me, um, I look at that team and, you know, to say they can't run it. I mean, Singletary ain't a bad back. Uh, it's just the design of the plays and those kind of things that you got to make sure you just calling the right stuff for them and giving it to them a little bit more. Uh, Buffalo likes to throw it around. We all know that. You know, they're going to try to showcase Josh and, and Josh going to run when he need to, you know. So, but, you know, I think the Eagles, like, early on when when they they got started, like, a year, last year, early in the season, they were doing the same thing. They were throwing it around and they was running uh, hurts too much. And, um, and they finally said, well, let's just design some plays and just hand it off. Let's just design some plays and hand it off and just work it from there. And I think that's probably what Buffalo going to have to do. I start just using Singletary and they – they got Hines there, uh, and uh, he's the more of a third down pass catching type back. But they just got to, you know, just design, just have some set calls that you're just going to run the ball and go from there, you know what I'm saying? Not rely on Josh to do it by himself all the time and just try to uh, throw the ball or try to run it too much. Because quarterback gets hurt. Those kind of quarterbacks get hurt when you try to yep, run them too much. Absolutely. And so that's what I kind of worry about with him sometimes, especially getting late in the season now. And late in the season is time, like everybody say, late in the season is the time to start running. You know, it's getting cold. People don't want to stick their hands out there, grab your touch, you don't want to tackle. And you just got to establish that run game. So they do got Singletary. I do believe in him. And uh, I think you just got to hand it off and have design runs. Yeah, Josh Joe. Allen puts himself at risk too much. And not only is, to Phillip's point, not only is Josh Allen a runner, but the way he runs, that he has a mentality of a running back, lowering his shoulder, not trying to duck and dodge you, but run people over. Late in the year, I don't want my quarterback trying to run linebackers over. I want my quarterback to get down so he can play the next play and we can make it to February. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you, it's, it's funny because actually uh, I'm wearing a Wyoming Cowboys uh, top today, which was a – a gift of a dear friend of uh, the MBS family, Sundance Wicks, gave this to me a couple weeks ago when I visited him out in Wyoming. Um, you, you hit the nail on the head, Joe. I mean, you know, he, Josh, he plays he plays with that reckless abandonment. And, I mean, you know, the question becomes, I we look at what happened with Ben Roethlisberger. Look at what happened with Cam Newton. They could handle that in their 20s. When they got into their 30s, Steelers weren't going to the Super Bowl anymore. Cam Newton was basically done at 30, 31. I don't care if these guys are 6'5", 6'6", 240, 250 pounds. At some point, those those hits, those blows that they take from gentlemen who are your size, Philip, <laughs> that odometer's running at all times, man. You can only take so many of those. And uh, if they don't have a, a solution in the running game, I mean, it, regardless, yes, Stefan Diggs is one of the top two, top three receivers in the, in the game. You could make, make a case for Justin Jefferson, but I mean, Stefan is right there. He can blow the top off any defense. 
Um, but if you can't move the chains and you can't grind out first downs on the ground, uh, it's going to be it's going to be very tough for them to win going in against the Kansas City, going against Baltimore. I mean, you know, the Ravens are going to make some noise in January. So uh, yeah. there's a lot to there, there's a lot of things that have to happen and some things that have to change. And you know, you've got a defensive guy there who you would think would be prone to more uh, defensive coach than Sean McDermott, who you would think would be more prone to running the ball. Um, a lot to there's a lot to unpack there and a lot, a lot of football still to be played. But uh, one thing is for sure, they're going to need to develop a balanced attack on offense if they're going to play deep into January and into February. You got to, man. And um, like Coach Gibbs always said, man, in order to win games, you got to run the football and stop the run. Well, they do a good job at stopping the run. I just got to get that run game going. And speaking of Coach Gibbs, man, I want to uh, send my condolences out to him. He lost his son, Coy, um, this past week. And, also, I want to send my condolences out to Dave Butts and his family. I'm um, keep you guys in our prayers, and and uh, it's just a tough situation right there that Coach Gills has, has now lost two sons, and I just imagine what he's going through. But uh, you know, I always love that guy, and, and I feel bad for him and and um, the situation that's happened. But at the same time, just know that we are praying for for the family, and um, we'll keep you guys in our thoughts and prayers. Yeah, I, I want to likewise. I, I we we all share that sentiment on this uh, on this program, but I do want to ask you uh, very quickly, Phil, because you know he was on the staff, and I had imagined that Corey was part of the recruiting process that brought you to DC. Uh, what are some of your thoughts? What are some of your experiences? Uh, I know that the father, of course, you and the father, you and Joe, are very close. Um, how did this hit for you when you found out? I mean. I found out the other day, somebody was talking to me and they told me, and I was like, you serious? And, um, you know, Corey's a little bit of a year older than me. And I'm like thinking to myself, man, he died. He's, he's 50 years old. And I remember him in the building, man, just working and doing the things that, you know, Joe needed him to do to make sure everybody had everything they needed. You know, he was easy to talk to, just a fun guy to be around, you know, and then he ended up leaving to go back and, you know, get the NASCAR team back on track right before Joe, Joe left. And then, I just remember that, you know, he was a guy that just worked hard and, and, and you know, he, he was easy to get along with, with everybody in the building, um, joy to be around. And then to hear that, man, it was a shock. I was like, because, you know, for me, I was thinking of this, this, this um, two sons now. And, you know, as, as parents, you never want your sons or your kids to go before you. And, you know, my thing is, I, I don't know what happened. I don't know what's the, the situation, what happened with that, but. At the same time, you know, my heart was my heart dropped, man, just for the fact that you know this has happened again uh, for Joe. You know, I know what kind of guy he is, and he's a God fearing guy. Uh, he yeah. do it the right way. Uh, he instilled that in his family, and we know Corey's in a good place now, in a, in a real good place now, and, and he'll see him again one day. But at the same time, you know, what I'm saying with Joe at his age, and you know, going through the Sean Taylor situation, then losing a son, and then losing another son, it's just. It's just like like everything's piling up, you know what I'm saying? And and and, and this this time and it, it, well, when you go through stuff like this, you the only thing you can fall back on is your faith. And he got he have he has a lot of that. He has a lot of that. And I'm pretty sure that uh he know where his son is and he know that he's gonna see him again one day. And I just feel bad for Joe, man, and uh the things they've gone through as a family. Um, awesome guy, you know, both of them, him and Corey and all um, all awesome guys, man. All of them just awesome. Yeah, I had a good time with all of them. Enjoyed my time with all of them, and I just hope that uh, the family can get through this and uh, and move forward. Joe, I, I happen to know a little bit about your, um, you know, I I've, I know your entire family, and uh, I, I was wondering if you're interested, if you could share a little bit about uh, your mother's story with how and why she became a uh, then Washington Redskins fan as it related to the Gibbs family? Oh, it's simply because of Joe Gibbs. I mean, my mom being a, a Christian God-fearing woman and her at a press conference hearing him quote a Bible verse one time, and then obviously he was active in the community supporting different churches. That was all she needed to know. So it was never with her. It's never been with my mom. Did Washington win or did Washington lose? How did Coach Gibbs do? He lost. Oh, man, I got to add it to my – I remember her literally writing on her – pamphlet that when i go to bible study we're going to add joe gibbs to the prayer circle because they took a loss this week he's probably got a rough one or she'd be watching a press conference but i'm watching and say man look at coach gibbs face you can see the stress and all the all, everything that's going through him got to pray for him got to pray for coach gibbs could care less if it was super bowl if it was going to be a winning season 
what's Coach Gibbs need? Does he need prayer? Is he doing good? Just because of the fact she knew that was a guy that before he went to sleep, he was bowing his head. When he woke up in the morning, he was bowing his head. And that was that was enough for her. You know, it's amazing. We live in a world now where everything is so politicized and polarizing. And, uh, you know, we could go on and on about faith here. You know, we, we, we certainly like to discuss football. But one of the things that has really resonated with me is just how open that entire Gibbs family has always been. Um, that here, a lot, of, a lot of people don't know this, that Joe Gibbs' wife, Pat, is a Latina. He married a woman of Mexican descent that he was at the forefront in the 1970s scouting and bringing black quarterbacks to the table and giving them opportunities. To me, that is really what a man of or a person of, of faith and Christianity, that's what it's supposed to be all about, is that we're all in this together. We're all, you know, we all make mistakes. We all have good days and bad days. And, uh, you know, that he was able to, from his platform, his position, he was able to really reach across so many racial barriers and so many uh, other barriers that we have with, within our society. And this is really, to me, what a man of God should represent. So um, my heart goes out to him. I cannot begin to imagine what it must be like to not only be- have to put one child in the ground, but both of your children uh, my heart goes out to uh, Heather, Melissa, uh, Pat, of course, and Coach Joe. Um, man, we love you. And uh, there's just so much, uh, so much sadness that that we feel for you. And uh, we just we want to give our our most sincere condolences, not only from the perspective, but from the entire MBS family. Uh, a man who I, we know that family meant so much to. Um, this has been. Um, I, it just it just knocked me on my uh, on my camera when I, when I first heard the, the, the <laughs> that, uh, this has really been a, a tough time for him. I can I can't imagine um, to shift gears a little bit. I mean, I initially some one of the thoughts that I had when uh, it was first announced that the commanders were up for sale was potentially would would Joe Gibbs be part of a group that would acquire the team? Um, I don't foresee that happening now. I think that he's probably going to live out his days. I would imagine really dedicated to his family at this point. Um, You know, it it is, he has had unbelievable highs. Uh, He's in two hall of fames. Uh, You know, he is a winner at the the highest level. Um, But I have to imagine that the rest of his time is going to be dedicated to uh, family. So, uh, Still so much to cover. Uh, do you want to jump into the Packers now, Joe, or do you want to? Uh... Yeah, absolutely. Keep on. Let's keep rolling. We got good good content going on. A lot to talk about. It's been a busy, busy couple of weeks in the NFL, and the Green Bay Packers are a disaster. <laughs> in- indeed, it has been. Uh, so, uh, very curious, gentlemen. Uh, what happens next with Aaron Rodgers? Is it a wrap for him? And what happens with the Packers? I uh, I saw that. I watched that game. I watched the whole game. Uh, Because I wanted to see what was going on with that team. Uh, Man, it was was disastrous, man. I mean, (laughs) you can tell that he's so frustrated. You know, he gets to the sideline and he's so he's just so angry that it's even hard for him to go out and play the way he needs to play. You know, and uh, I look at that team and, and, and see that, you know, of course, get into the game and Dobbs go down with an injury. You already got guys who can't catch the ball, but you got guys going down with injury. Uh, you know, nothing's working with the offense. It seems like, you know, he, he, he got the thumb injury going on and it seemed like his balls are not as accurate as they used to be. Uh, it's just so much going on with that team. They just got to regroup, man. And I don't think it's going to happen this year because, you you know, you played Detroit. <laughs> you played Detroit and – you know, and every team that's played Detroit this year has put up a lot of points. And so, but you get beat by Detroit and it's just like, man, I don't, I don't know if they can survive it now. You know what I'm saying? I, you know, my thing is, no, Detroit's a better team, but you know, they have given up a lot on defense this year and they, they weren't able to move the ball at all against Detroit. So I just think that uh, when you look at him on the field, he's so frustrated that he can't even play the game the way he should play it. Play it. And, you know, Devontae Adams, go to show you how much he meant to that team. Devontae yeah, Adams meant so much to him and bailing him, bailing him out sometimes. He can just throw that thing up, he go get it. 
Uh, you know what I'm saying? And now he don't have that anymore. And now he's throwing it to guys who you don't know if they're going to catch it, if you hit them in the hands. Uh, you know, the old line is struggling. You know, he, he can't stay upright. He's getting hit a lot. Uh, it's just it's just look bad, man. So I, I just think that you know they just gonna have to take it one game at a time and see what happens throughout the rest of this year. But I don't see I don't see them recovering from this not this year. Yeah, I think this is the most I've ever seen Aaron Rodgers get hit in his whole career. Maybe since his first season as a starter for Green Bay, just a disastrous uh, season, like Phillips said since the beginning. I mean, this is a team that I thought the way I saw this season running in my head for the Packers was. The offense take a while to, to get things together, but that's okay. They have a pretty stout defense that can keep them in games and also keep their season maintained until the offense starts clicking and nothing could be from the opposite. The defense is struggling, hit with the injury bug, and like we talk about all the time on this show, NFL is really next man up mentality and their depth has just not been there. So I think if I'm the Packers, maybe another week, two weeks of Aaron Rodgers is starting quarterback. After that, we really got to see what we got uh, in Jordan Love. I do not think that Aaron Rodgers needs to talk about retirement. I think he still has a lot of great skill set, but the people around him this season so far are not on his level. Uh, as far as being able to – he's throwing back shoulder fades. The guys are running slants. He's throwing slants. The guys are running fades. It's just a, a lot of a mess going on. Like Phillip said, I think he gets so frustrated so quickly that by the time it comes to the next series, next play, he hasn't even recovered from being angry about the last play. So I think if I'm the Green Bay Packers, maybe another game or two, and if I don't see any improvement, we're going to see what we got in this kid, Jordan Love. Well, I'm going to keep cheating here, and I'm going to go over to the mailbag again because we got a question about the Packers, and uh, Leon wants to know is uh, could could Matt LaFleur be in trouble? I don't think so. Yeah, I, 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 he, he's, I mean, he's made the playoffs um, the years he's been there. I mean, everybody can see that this roster that they got and – the injuries and the receiver group just hadn't hadn't jailed. I mean, they don't have a go-to guy at the receiver position, you know. Um, I thought that, uh, you know, maybe some other guys would step up, you know, tight end in those areas, but it, had, it, it just ain't happened. Uh, I don't think he's in trouble, you know what I'm saying? He's done a good job there. He's done a really good job there, you know what I'm saying? Just the thing that happened to them, it will happen to most teams. You know, you pay the quarterback a bunch of money and your talent diminish around him and your talent diminish on defense too because – you, you know, you got a salary cap. I mean, you pay him a whole lot of money and you ain't going to have the same quality of a team. Uh, most of the teams that win in this league, look at the Jets and look at some of these teams that's winning, they have a young quarterback that who, that hadn't got their second deal yet. So those right. are the kind of teams that win and get the Super Bowl. Look at us when we won the Super Bowl. You know, we had Carson Wentz on his first deal. Then we had Foles come off as a backup, you know. So if you don't pay a lot of money in that position, look, look at Philly. Hurts. You know, right. he, he's a quarterback that ain't got to a second deal yet. So the thing is, if you don't spend a lot of money at that position and you get it and it's the early stages of a quarterback's career and you can go out there and you got better players around him everywhere, then you're going to have success. And that's why some of these teams are having success right now because they haven't paid the quarterback. So as soon as they pay the quarterback, it's a different story. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, whether or not Matt LaFleur is in trouble, I, 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 I don't think he's in trouble this year. Um, you know, may, perhaps at the end of next year, if they crank out a 4-13 and 13 season, then, you know, maybe they, they reevaluate. Uh, I think that, again, you gentlemen have hit, have hit on a lot of this. Uh, the situation with Devontae Adams, it, it changed it, – it forever changed the chemistry of that entire locker room. Uh, Aaron Rodgers is somebody who is slow to trust people, but when he does trust you, he will go to you over and over and over again. And uh, him, Devontae had a very special chemistry. I still think that Devontae is one of the top two, top three receivers in the, in the game. He's he's certainly right there with Justin Jefferson and with Stefan Diggs. I mean, you know, he, he is a phenomenal talent even now. Um you know, I, I don't know where uh, the Packers go this offseason. I, I would I would have thought that they would be in the running for an Odell Beckham, maybe a Chase Claypool, that they would bring in another weapon for, for Aaron to, to, to have on offense. Uh, they have not been able to do so. Now, some people have the philosophy that that's because of a lack of ownership there. I don't know whether or not that's true or not, where, you know, Aaron could go to a, a Robert Kraft or go to a, a you know, a, a, Stan Kroenke, I'm sorry, I couldn't think of the name here, or, or somebody in the, the York DeBartolo family or Jerry Jones and say, hey, you know, get get me somebody else to throw to. You know, hey, Odell's out there. Make this happen. I, I need another weapon. And Aaron doesn't have that luxury. So uh, what what happens? Uh, 
I, I think that he probably does make it through this season, uh, even if the Packers don't make it to the playoffs. Um, but I think if he rolls out another clunker next year, uh, maybe Matt LaFleur is in trouble. Yeah. I, I think see. you'll see. I think Aaron Rodgers might be gone before you see LaFleur. No offense. Like, I think that Aaron Rodgers, if he doesn't make the playoffs, this, think about all the drama and stuff he caused this offseason. Contract, no contract. Will you take less money so that Devontae Adams can be re-signed? Yes or no? Imagine him in this offseason after having a bad season where you got beat up and hit a lot and all the wolves are out saying you don't got it anymore and you're done. Right. I, I think you're really pushed to get out of Green Bay. Yeah, I mean, I can I can see that. Um, I, can, I can definitely see that because you got to go back, you know, when the COVID stuff was going on about the, um, you know, that stuff. It was a whole, it's been going on for a while there. Uh, and LaFleur's Le, done a great job of just dealing with him and, and trying to get through it. But at the same time, like, I, I'm with you on that, Joe. Uh, I think that, yeah, I mean, LaFleur could still be there. He could be traded, you know, say in a second. You know, they can go to love at any time. Uh, he, he just don't look happy there. I, I'm just telling you. Not at all. Aaron Rodgers, he just don't look happy. And so the best thing to do is find a, a suitor that willing to take him and take on that contract, which is probably going to be tough. You know, right now, but unless you, I don't know, I don't know, you got to get something back that's great in return. So we'll see, man. It's a lot of teams that need quarterbacks, but I always know that when you pay the quarterback, then your team is your team suffers a little bit in other positions. Yeah, absolutely. We still have so much to cover here. We have to get into our mailbag. Uh, well, we, we, I've gotten into the mailbag a little bit early this <laughs> this, this show, but. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit uh, around the corner about the state of the NFL, where some of the awards are halfway through the season. Uh, stay tuned. You're watching The Perspective right here on Nuts and Bolts Sports. Hey, football fans. We have a great offer for you from one of our newest partners, FanDuel Sportsbook. Sign up now for a new FanDuel account by using our special link located in the description, and you will get a no-sweat bet up to $1,000. That means that you can bet up to $1,000 on your first wager risk-free. FanDuel will give you the amount you wagered back in free bets if you lose. So go ahead and bet on your favorite team this Sunday, and even if they lose, you are taken care of. To claim this special offer, just click the link in the description and create a new account. Then, make your first bet on whatever you like. That's it. Win some money at FanDuel today. And welcome back, everybody. It's one of our favorite uh, It's one of our favorite se sections of the show. We're going to get into our mailbag. We're going to answer your tweets, your emails, your texts. A lot to cover here. Again, I cheated a little bit throughout the show. I went a little bit early, but... Uh, we're going to get right in. We're going to get into one of our favorite viewers. DeAndre says, Big man, I want to follow up with you from last show. Steve McNair was the last black quarterback from an HBCU to go in the first round. Will, with the emergence of HBCU football, when will we see another? Or will we see another? Ooh. It's going to be a while. <laughs> oh, wow. uh, I think it's going to be a while, man. Uh, Sanders, son, Philip? Huh? What about Deion Sanders' son? Yeah, but he's two years out, right? I mean, his second year, he got another yeah. year. Yeah, you're right. So it's going to be – and we don't know if he's going to be a first-round quarterback, you know. So Stephen there is a special talent, though. You, he's, he's a different kind oh. of guy. I mean, that guy there, man, he was awesome. Um, but, yeah, we could see Deion son. I mean, he could, he could have a shot. You know, they're starting to get more, more scouts down there to those practices and stuff and watching them, you know. Um, I just think it's going to be a little while – so I mean, if it's not Dion's son, it's gonna be a while. So he's the one that the only one I can think of right now that's out there that's hey. playing at a high level. So I, 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 I'm not sure. Joe. Yeah, I think it's only a matter of time. I mean, the one thing that Deion Sanders is doing, like Philip said, is bringing exposure to HBCU. So I think there's a guy right now, we're filming this, we're doing this show. He's watching film, lifting weights that we know nothing about, that hopefully a scout will get a chance to see him play and he'll get drafted in the first round. But it's going to happen again. It's a question of when. That's true. Hey, let me ask you this. Do you guys – I don't see it happening. But, you know, the Auburn job just came available and right. um, Georgia Tech job. And there's been rumors of Dion might entertain – I don't see it. I don't see him entertaining either one of those jobs. Uh, my thing is, I think he's going to be at Jackson State until the likes of Florida State or yes. – one of these big schools come available. You know, sure. so I don't see him taking a, a Auburn. That just, that just don't. That's not his cup of tea to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I know they're gonna throw a lot of money at him and stuff like that. 
But I think that yes, Dion yes. know that he he has a purpose and a plan uh, um, for the HBCUs, and he's going to stick to it and stay with it as long as he can before he move on. At least until his sons, I think, to his sons leave uh, and then go from there. I'd agree with that. Yeah, I don't think that Auburn – I definitely know Georgia Tech ain't on his radar, no matter mm-hmm. how much money they, they roll back there. And Auburn, I don't know, man. They have a – unfortunately for them, I think a lot of – I follow college football pretty closely, and a lot of people are, are still tying – as they probably should, uh, Tommy Tumberville and his comments to Auburn. So I don't, I don't know if Deion yeah. Sanders wants to come on the heels of that, even a lot of money. And like you said, Phil, I think for him the dream job would be taking Florida State from where they are now and bringing them back to the Bobby Bowden era, and right. also making a rack of money while you're doing it. Right. And also a shout out to my Georgia Bulldogs for handling business <laughs> against Tennessee. Tennessee uh, frauds. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody thought Tennessee was going to come in there and roll over us like they did Alabama. But you gotta realize we got a defense over there, you know what I'm saying? We got a we got a nice little powerhouse there, you know. It's gonna be a while. We may we may win two or three championships. We, we may take over Nick Saban's spot. As we record reporting the show, they just dropped the top four for this week. So it goes Georgia one, Ohio State two, TCU is uh four, and Michigan's number three. Okay. And then Tennessee five and Oregon is at number six. Where's Alabama now? <laughs> Uh, probably at the at home right now doing homework, watching the show. Mad. Hey, I tell you, I told my, I t- on my Facebook, I told them that they're gonna be in the tax slayer bowl in Jacksonville. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? No, take nothing away. You can't, you can't take nothing away from Nick Saban, man. He's done a whole lot of years. Sure, um, that dude is genius, man. He's just having a rough year. I mean, they they re- they get they young right now, and the defense ain't as solid as it used to be. So I think he got to rebuild that that team, and you know he's a good recruiter, so they'll they'll turn it around and get it back next year. Yeah, and you know my my hat goes off to uh, Marcus, who's doing a fantastic job up there with Notre Dame. Uh, they blew the doors off of Clemson this weekend as well. So uh, you know there's there's a there's a changes abound in in college football. Uh, you know the more that things. Things, things are changing. Some things are staying the same. Uh, I, I Likewise, gentlemen, I think that uh, it's, it's going to be really hard. If, if Florida State throws a boatload of money at Dion, that would be really hard to turn down the alma mater. I mean, I don't think Phil, you know. yeah, yeah, I mean, Philip, I mean, if I were to put this out at you, if you were, say, a defensive line coach, et cetera, et cetera, but you were offered either head coach or defensive coordinator with the dogs, do you walk away from that? I'm gone. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I can tell you right now, it's uh, there's something about the alma mater, man. It just yeah, it is, it is. You know, and I, I think, like I said, uh, Dion um, has a plan uh, for the HBCUs, and he know his job ain't over yet. He know he ain't done yet, and so you got to think about what he's doing for not only his team but the rest of the HBCUs. Uh, he's selling out crowds when you go on the road to those other teams, and they're making money and you're getting them where they need to be. He's getting them recognition. This is the, this is the most scouts that ever been at their practices. Hell yeah! I mean, he's doing a hell of a job, man. So I, I, it's hard for me to see him walking away before he get the job finished, at, or at least before his sons leave and go on to the next level. Yeah, a- absolutely. I mean, I, I think that we, what we have seen in the last four or five years or so with with the HBCUs and DeAndre, thank you so much. I mean, you've you've been you've brought a couple of. Uh, really great questions about HBCUs um, to the table. Uh, I think that what we have seen in the last couple of years, we've, we've touched on this a little bit, but when you see the likes of Rod Milstead, Eddie George, Hugh Jackson, uh, Dion, of course, you see the, you know, Florida A&M could certainly come into play at any given time. The Rattlers have a, a wonderful tradition. Uh, you see what's happening with these HBCUs where the facilities have been upgraded. The scouts are showing up. Uh, Doug Williams and Shaq Harris opened up a, um, an HBCU Hall of Fame. Uh, there's just, there's, it's such a, a special time, I would say, uh, in the history of HBCUs here in America, uh, where the exposure is, has never been better. The opportunities have never been better. They've really done an incredible job, I think, to level the playing field uh, for HBCUs to really compete against the traditional uh, blue bloods of college football. So, uh, a lot of really exciting things uh, happening to that end, um, and I'm I'm certainly along for the ride. I love to see it. 
Um, we had another question here, and I can't seem to find it, but it had something to do with offensive coordinators. Um, Ken Dorsey and Byron Left, which I, I, you know what, I'll just pull it up here. Okay. Uh, Ken Dorsey and Byron Left, which do both of them get a head coaching job next year? And that is from Thomas. Well, I, I think both deserve opportunity to get one. Uh, I'm not sure if they will, but you no, know, I mean, you know, Byron, he interviewed last year. Jacksonville was close, uh, but you, you know, he just made a lot of demands, and that's the only reason he was he ain't at Jacksonville. But at the same time, I can see both of them getting an opportunity to be a head coach, and they deserve it. You know, I mean, uh, Tampa Bay is struggling a little bit this year on on offense, uh, but you know, my thing is, you no, know, every year is different for teams. You know, you can't really fault him for that. You know, and then my thing is, I said the last time, you know, whenever um, a head coach, when somebody and then, inherit a team you can't just think that that team is going to be the same as they were before and so that whole team is different you know what i'm saying and they're actually doing all they can down there to try to win games and they do still got a solid defense and um, baron doing a good job with the offense so i can see but if you no know, i see one if not both of them having that opportunity yeah i can see byron left which ken dorsey i don't know i think he might still have to earn his stripes a little bit but a deep playoff run by the buffalo bills can wipe all that away so We'll have to see. I mean, Left, which obviously was a hot name this past offseason, has the pedigree as far as who's been doing it longer. Uh, but I think Ken Dorsey right now, and you got a Josh Allen in your pocket, and you can say, look what I did with this young man. Look where I took his career. He might have a leg up on him. So we'll see. Also, yeah. Larry, also Larry uh, um, I'm going to let you go, and I'll come back. Oh, no, no, no. I was just going to say. Oh, you know, I, just want, I just want to give a shout-out to this guy because he deserved it this week. Joe Mixon. Oh. Yeah. Fantasy football kid. I mean, this dude put five. I thought you were going to say Eric the enemy or somebody. Yep. Okay. Five. I got to say something about him. You know what I'm saying? We can't do the show and don't say nothing about what he did this week. You know, uh, that was amazing, man. I mean, well, DeAndre, ask us a question about Joe Mixon next week. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what I will say is, um, you know, I, I think Joe, again, you kind of hit that. You, you, I, I may I need to go in front of you one of these one of these talk calls. I think that, uh, I, I think that uh, you know Ken Dorsey again. Uh, I, I would say probably another year or two uh, in order to really develop his seasoning. I mean, of course, the one the one highlight I can think of him this season is smashing his headset. So uh, you know that's uh, not necessarily the best of looks, but uh, I do think Ken Dorsey is probably a season or two away uh one of the things we hit on this a little bit earlier uh you know if you remember when byron leffert was playing both both at marshall jacksonville atlanta and then on uh with the steelers he played from the pocket and when you play from the pocket you 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 see the game very differently i'm not surprised that byron is is an offensive coordinator and doing a, a very good job with the buccaneers um, there's no doubt in my mind, I would think that Byron is going to be on anybody's short list next season. I would not rule out contingent upon whoever becomes the commander's new owner. I think Ron is still on thin ice. Um, that if that job opens up, I mean, that could be one whale of a homecoming. Um, wanted to also get into the state of the NFL a little bit. Uh, some of the awards halfway through the season, we can just kind of do this round table. Uh, Joe, who's your rookie of the year? Uh, defensive gotta be sauce Gardner without a yep. doubt. That kid, that kid is just, I mean, the swag he brings in that defense, he's not alone on the defense of the jets, but I think when you got a guy that can shut down a whole entire side of the field and also make plays too, when the opportunity arises, I would have to go with him for a uh, defensive rookie of the year. As far as offensive, ah, oh, man, there's so many good rookies out there. It's tough to, it's tough to make a choice about that one. I have to think about the offense. I got to come back, but defense, I'll go sauce Gardner. Okay, I'll, so I'll, I'll, I'll go offense first, and I'm going to go with Walker, the running back for Seattle. Oh, okay, sure. Okay, I think he should be in 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 that hunt because he's he's changed that team. That's a great call. The way they run the ball and the things they do, and I'm I agree with you, uh, Joe Sauce. Sauce a different kind of guy, man. <laughs> uh, he one of the best out there, and he's young. And just imagine what he's going to be years from now. You know, what I'm saying uh, we talking like we talking about Sauce like we talked about Sean Taylor. Anyway, so I think he's going to be a good one, man. I just think he's going to be a shutdown corner, be able to match him up on whoever you want to match him up on, and he shut it down. I know Diggs caught a pass on him this past week, but he came right back and got an interception. Uh, he's just one of those guys that battle, man. I, I love the way he play, and he's a big reason why the Jets winning right now. 
I'll tell you, uh, Chris Olave is doing some impressive things down there in New Orleans. Unfortunately, their record doesn't necessarily support it. I could see him as offensive rookie of the year. Uh, I think we're we're in unison in terms of Sauce Gardner. I mean, he is the he might be the best since since Daryl and Dion were doing it. Um, you know, he's made a lot of people in New York already forget about Darrell Revis. He's just that freaking dominant. And we're eight games into his career. Uh, Sauce Gardner. I don't want to. I don't want to put him in Canton yet. But wow. <laughs> uh, you know, um, good job. Good job by Joe Douglas, man. We're, you know, finding this guy in the draft and having you know, guts enough to draft him early and, and get him in there, man. Because you know, Joe. Joe is a he. He one of those GMs, man. Where he know his stuff, man. He know what he's doing. He know who he want. Yeah, you know, he has his mind made up who he wants, he's going to take him. So he did a good job with this unit the last few years, just getting guys in there that love to play football, love to compete, and that's why they're having success on the field. I dare say we're all in agreement, we're all in alliance about uh, Geno Smith being the comeback player of the year. Oh, yeah, for sure. No okay. All right, we just move on to the next subject then. Uh, who you got for coach of the year? I'll, Phil. Well, you already said it earlier. I was in Seattle. <laughs> Pete Carroll, man. I, I mean, just to think that you lose Russ and to think that this team had no chance. I mean, even he probably thought it, man. We're gonna be talking. <laughs> even you know, he probably thought it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna go with Gino and see what happens, you know. So it's gonna be tough. <laughs> but uh man, the job he's done with that team and the way they've grown every week, because I'm sending them the first game of the season. Defense didn't look that well that first game of the season. I was like, man, the defense going to struggle all year. They got better and better. The offense got better and better. Um, you know, I mean, they still got those receivers. And they just, I mean, Geno is, man, I'm just telling you, man, what he's done and, and how he's coached him and, this, you know, the situations that he's he's just put Geno in good situations so he don't fail, you know, just manage the games and, and just take what they give you. I mean, he's done a hell of a job down in Seattle, man. So, I mean, to be his age and – Everybody's saying, well, this is probably going to be his last year. He probably walk away from it right. after this year. He's going to retire, blah, blah, blah. Man, I think he might die being the Seahawks coach. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I just think he might, he might, man. You know, I met with him a few years ago. Oh, so got Philip Daniels that moment, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> I interviewed with him at the Combine for assistant D-line position. Man, he, he's a great guy, full of energy, full of spirit. Uh, I'm, I'm happy for him, man. He deserve it. Uh, how do I follow up yeah. that? I, I'm gonna go very. I'm gonna go to your roots, Philip, and uh, you know I'm not rooting for this guy just because he has an eye at the end of his name. Because I'll tell you, he play. It's within my division, but Nick Sirianni's undefeated this year, and uh, what he, how he has gotten the buy in Philadelphia, is just uh, it's unbelievably impressive. I, I I remember watching his first press conference and thinking to myself. I don't see how this is going to work. And boy, was I wrong. He took him to the playoffs last year. He's got Jalen just balling the freak out. Uh, he's 8 0 this year. And I mean, I would be shocked if they dropped two games along the way. Uh, the Eagles are just flat out balling. Uh, Joe, I had to jump in front of you at least once because I, I don't know if you're going <laughs> to no, go out on me. So uh, I'm going to turn this one over to you now. Just to be different from everybody else, I'm going to go with Brian Dayball from the New York Giants. Oh, yeah. This is a team oh, that sure. I thought was going to win. Good three, four, maybe five games are lucky. And and the fact that he seems to have some pretty good knowledge of hip-hop, always reciting and singing along Biggie after every game, I got to respect that as well. I'm going to go with Brian Dayball on the Giants. <laughs> MVP. Joe, who you got? Oh, man. After what I saw on Sunday, Patty Mahomes, man. He could have thrown the ball 80 times if they needed him to on Sunday. Uh, just Patrick Mahomes is having a great season. Uh -oh. Nice. I'm a, I'm just gonna stick with my guy. I'm, I'm, until they lose, which I don't I don't see them losing until they probably face Tennessee or maybe Dallas again. Maybe they'll lose one of those games. Maybe not. I'm gonna stay with Jalen Hurts, man, right now because they undefeated. You know, for the same reason, uh, you know, Larry uh, chose the coach. You know, you gotta choose the quarterback as the MVP. To me, you I know, like that. So I, I can see that happening, man. So we'll see how they go the rest of the season. I really think that. They could go undefeated, but Tennessee or Dallas got a great shot at beating them. Those are the only teams I can see. We'll see. Anything happened in this league, though, you know that. <laughs> yeah. I, I would definitely uh, go uh, with you as well, Philip. I'm, I'm going to go Jalen Hurts, but I'm going to tell you, you go a little further south on I-95, and Lamar Jackson is starting to really heat it up. Yeah. And uh, 
you know, he, he's, he's like an avalanche every year. He just keeps getting better and better as we get into November and December. He's going to keep things very, very interesting. Um, a dark horse I'll throw out at you. Uh, Kirk Cousins has had an incredible year. Uh, I, and I didn't see it coming. Uh, but, you know, I can't argue with 7-1. and one. Um, I, I cursed his name plenty of times uh, publicly and privately when he was a quarterback. And watched <laughs> but, uh, you know, if he finishes up 14-3 and three or so and they, they host at least one playoff game, if not two, uh, that's going to be a tough argument to uh, to go against, but right now I I, I just I got to go with Jalen as well. So uh, I guess maybe, I guess, yeah. I guess my dark horse would be Gino since we talked about him earlier. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean we had we had the question come in earlier as to yeah. you know is he a legit uh, is he a legit MVP candidate? I I think there's no question about it. Right. He just he just keeps winning games on a team that largely most experts were picking to pick in the top two or three next year. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So uh, anything else we want to touch on, gentlemen? I'm looking through the mailbag. It looks like that's about it. Uh, anything else we want to get into as we get into the, we get into the second half of the season? I'm just excited no. to see how it's, all, how it's all going to play out. A lot of teams that will take that bye week, and sometimes they come back out with a new mindset, make some adjustments, players get healthy and come back. A lot of these teams that have lost guys in the beginning of the season, that are getting guys back. Just excited to see how the second half is going to play out. Because, like I said, the Vikings will have a great regular season. They'll win the division and they'll blow. They'll flame out in the playoffs. I still stand by that. Yeah, and I want to see how the Jets finish the season. Um, they look good, man. They are actually like they're playing complimentary football on every level. You know, saying defense, uh, offense, and special teams. So, I mean, I just want to see how they finish the season. How things end up with them. You know, they're beating people that nobody thought they could beat. And they're a young team and they're hungry. So I want to see how they finish the season. But one of the great things about doing this show is uh, that you, we can hold each other accountable in terms of who's right and who's wrong. And uh, <laughs> I had Green Bay and the Rams in the NFC Championship. So that's clearly uh, – that that went up in smoke. I don't even know uh, – I, I think Seattle could end up winning the NFC West. And if that if that comes into play, you know, that 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 could eliminate the Niners fairly early in the in playoffs as well. Uh, this has just been an incredible first half of the season. And, uh, gentlemen, I enjoy doing this guy with you, gentlemen, uh, every week so much. This is, uh, this is a highlight to me, and it's always great to be around this positive energy. So uh, I think we're about done for this week. But you know where to find us. Hit us up in the mailbag. Always feel free to ask us questions. We're always more than happy to, to bring on different subjects, and we want to hear from you guys. So uh, – Thank you so much for hanging out with us again for another week of the perspective right here on Nuts and Bolts Sports. We'll catch in with you. We'll check in with you next week.